What's up my stat stars, Michael Princhuk here and the AP Statistics exam is not that far away. So in this video, I wanna give you my top 10 tips to make sure that you get a five on the AP Statistics exam. Now, two things that are not included in these top 10 tips are actually really, really important as well. First, you have to know how to use the reference sheets and I have an entire video in the description below that just talks about what's on the reference sheet and how to use it. And second, you have to know how to use your calculator. Now, a lot of the AP statistics exam can be done without a calculator. So much of it focuses on you understanding and knowing the concepts without using a calculator. But trust me, there are gonna be some problems you need to use your calculator, so make sure you know how to use it. I have several videos that use the TID4 calculator and the numerous calculator to make sure that you know how to use those calculators to help you on the AP statistics exam. All right, let's dive into the top 10 tips to make sure you are prepared for the exam. Best of luck and I hope everybody scores a five. Tip number 10, talk like you know what you're talking about. Don't misuse terms. They can actually take points off if you misuse a term. For example, stratified is the term that we use when we're selecting samples where blocking is very much like stratified, but that is what we do in experiments. So don't misuse those terms. A lot of times kids will say that something's biased, they'll say that's skewed. No, skewed is the shape of a, a quantitative distribution graph. Bias is when your question or your wording of your problem or something that you do could lead to answers that don't reflect the truth. So again, just don't misuse terms. Um, saying that a population follows a normal model. Normal model is such a very specific thing. Don't accidentally misuse that term. So make sure that you understand that it needs to be said to be normal, or if it's a sampling distribution, you need to check those conditions to make sure that the sampling distribution is going to be normal. But again, talk like you know what you're talking about. Don't misuse terms. Don't try to do a little too much, and then all of a sudden you say something that doesn't sound right. All right. Manage your time. This is really important. Multiple choices first. You got 40 questions in 90 minutes. That's 2.25 minutes per problem. That's actually a ton of time. So utilize it. There are going to be about 25 questions that are pretty quick, short, either going to know the answer or it takes one math step to get the answer. And there's going to be around 15 in the, for most kids that they, it takes multiple steps. They have to really think about it. So, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, set a timer and spend exactly two minutes and 25 or two minutes, 2.25 minutes on every single problem because some are going to take much shorter. But if you're spending five, six, seven minutes on a problem, move on. Don't spend too much time on problems you don't know how to do. Make an educated guess. Typically, two of the five multiple choice are just completely wrong if you just think about what the problem is asking. And then all of a sudden, you've got a one third chance of guessing it right. When you get to the FRQs, there are six of them. Now on the AP test, it actually says to spend 25 minutes on question six. It actually, it's almost like it's a separate part, but no one's gonna tell you, you know, no one's gonna say, all right, stop, put numbers one through five away and now turn to number six. No, absolutely not. You get all six of them at the same time. You can do any of them in any order you want. But here's what I'm telling you. This is my recommendation. Other teachers may say different things, but I wouldn't even look or touch or read number six until I'm confident I have done my absolute best on one, two, three, four, and five. Most students are going to accumulate their points on questions one, two, three, four, five. One's usually pretty easy, so try to knock that one down. If you struggle with probability and you, you get to number two or three and you're like, oh, that's a probability one, maybe save that till the end. But again, really focus on getting one, two, three, four, and five done. If you look at the clock and you have five minutes left, well then just read number six, maybe you could do part A. Or if you look at the clock and you got 20 minutes left, well then maybe you could try to get a little bit more of number six done. But number six is a tougher problem. It is worth a little bit more, but don't stress about having to get everything right. Just focus on what you can do and then move on to number six when you're at the end. Now listen, you might get part A right, you might get part B and then you're like, I don't even know how to do this. So, so don't let that panic you. Most kids, if they approach something that they don't know how to do, they just stop and they move on. Don't do that, right? Always try something. Try to never leave any part completely blank. Even if you could put something down, it could help. Like I even tell students, make something up. Like maybe C is what is your conclusion? And you're like, well, I didn't even, I didn't even get a P value to make a conclusion. Well then make a P value up. Just say, ah, oh, the P value is 0.04. I'm going to reject an all because it's less than 0.05. Whatever. But that is showing that you somewhat understand the process. So try not to leave anything blank. Try to do everything you can. 
So be confident, but don't let a bad part bring you down. Like, if, if, you know, don't let two multiple choice in a row that you don't know how to do affect your attitude and think, oh, I'm going to fail this test. Or maybe part A of, of number five you struggle with, you know, just move on. Keep yourself confident. Tip number eight, be prepared for a question about inference. I promise that FRQ or two will involve an inference procedure. We've learned, I have 10 of them listed here, but we actually have learned many more if you've done everything in your class. So some classes end early and don't necessarily get to everything. It all depends who your teacher is and where you are. But listen, there are tons of different inference procedures. There's intervals, there's tests, there's Z tests, there's one sample, there's two sample, there's chi-square tests. So again, really make sure that you know how to do all of those. Um, I have a really cool document for, uh, I call it the book of inference. It has um, examples and the procedures for every single type of inference. Shoot me an email at helpwithapstats at gmail.com if you want. And I can send that document to you that actually goes through all the different inference procedures. But I'm just telling you, don't overlook inference because one of the questions, maybe even two of them will cover it. Now, when it comes to inference, make sure you know the process. Because again, maybe you don't remember how to do a specific thing, but you know the process and showing that you know that process can actually still get you some points. So both involve four steps, whether it be an interval or a test. For an interval, you have to name the procedure and state exactly what it is you're looking for. I'm looking for the mean weight of all bullfrogs in Alabama, whatever. Check the conditions because you need to make sure that the sampling distribution is connected there. So make sure your sampling distribution is normal. You got to really check those conditions. Show work to build the interval. That's actually the easy part. A lot of that work is actually available to you on the formula sheet. Interpret the interval in the context of the problem. So again, this is what I was talking about earlier. Maybe you completely crap the bed and you don't remember how to build the interval, make an interval up and then you should be able to interpret it. And I'm 95% confident that the true mean weight of a bullfrog is somewhere between two and six pounds, whatever. But at least you're showing that you know how to do that step. That could still get you some points. When it comes to a test, step one is naming the test and giving those hypotheses and clearly labeling those parameters. Make sure that you're, if you just put a, a P, make sure you are telling me what that P represents, the proportion of kids that play sports in Ohio, whatever. Number two, again, checking those conditions to build that sampling distribution. Three is really about determining your sample. How weird or not weird is your sample? And that all connects down to finding what we call test statistic, which could be a Z-score or a T-score, and the P-value. Understanding a p-value is really big. Like if you truly think that you get what a p-value is, whether it was taught to you well or, or you just know it, then that's actually going to help you in a lot of FRQs or multiple choice. But a p-value is the probability of your sample statistic occurring or more extreme, assuming the null hypothesis is true. So just getting that through your brain and being able to understand how I have to start with my sample statistic, I have to then find the T-score or uh, Z-score of my sample statistic, and then I could use that T or Z to get my P-value using either the charts in the cheat sheets or using the normal CDF or TCDF on your calculator. But it's not that complicated of a process if you just take your time with it. I have lots of videos that go through all that in way more detail, so please you know, watch if you need to. And then the final step is make a conclusion in context based on that p-value. And again, that's what I said. Maybe you completely forget how to find that p-value, make one up, and then make a conclusion in context. It's still going to get you a lot of good points. Tip number seven, no naked answers. What I mean by this is on the FRQs, show all work. Indicate clearly the methods that you use because you will be graded on the correctness of your methods as well as the accuracy and completeness of your results. So don't ever just say Z equals 2.54. Like literally show me the work for that. I took my value, I subtracted the mean, I divided by the standard deviation or the standard error. Like show the work. Same thing. Don't say, oh, the mean is 65. Explain how you got that. Like, how did you figure out that the mean was 65 or the median was 55? Make sure that you either explain or show your work. Words are great. Math work is great. Whatever. When it comes to probabilities, don't just say 12% as a final answer. Like, how did you get that? What are you actually trying to find the probability of? Like label it, right? So maybe you write down the probability that um, in a binomial model, X is greater than or equal to two, that is 12%, okay? That makes a little bit more sense. It's more explanation as to what it is you're actually finding. So no naked answers. Don't just give numbers, show work and explain in context if you need to. Always write in context for the FRQs. There we go, okay. 
you will not be asked very many cookie cutter problems in the FRQs. Maybe part A could be something pretty simple, but oftentimes they're going to be asking you to think and apply multiple concepts that you have learned. So be prepared to go beyond just filling in the blank and doing one step things, okay? Always write in context. And think about this, like, the question is always going to be dealing with something, right? If you know anything about, if you've been doing any kind of practice for AP questions, you know that the questions always have a, a, a unique context to them. Like a couple of years ago, there was a problem that dealt with the proportion of people that go to a restaurant and fill up their um, water cup with something other than water, like pop or lemonade, whatever. Like that's a cool problem. There's a lot of context there. So when you're giving your answer, make sure you're talking about the proportion of people who fill up their water cup with something other than water. Like use the words directly from the problem. Uh, oftentimes the, the question is there. So use that question to make sure that you're wording things properly. Like all of the words you need in your answer are going to be in the problem. So use them. All right, tip number five, the normal model is king. If you truly understand the normal model, what it represents, how it works, Z-scores, probability, using normal CDF on your calculator, invert norm on your calculator. If you understand how the sampling distributions all, if the conditions are met, use a normal model, then you actually are going to do great. I mean, really, so much of information, multiple choice FRQs on the AP exam is built on the normal model. It really is king. So if you don't know the normal model, you might be in trouble. Hopefully, you do understand it. Tip number four, read each choice to the multiple choice questions. All right? Now, a lot of times, kids will read number A or, or choice A and they're like, oh, that's it. That's exactly what I was thinking. And it's like, well, wait a minute. Maybe something choice E is actually a little bit better. So many times when there's a lot of reading on the multiple choice, it could be the difference of one word. Maybe one word says sample mean and one word says population mean. Well, boy, that, that's a big difference, whether it's a sample mean or population mean. That can completely change your choice. So take your time and read, circle, highlight, underline keywords that could help you make the right choice. But don't just stop at the first one you read just because you like how it sounds. Tip number three, don't write too much. Sometimes less is actually more. Answer the question in context, then shut up and move on. Get to the point of what it asks and answer it. You know, oftentimes kids will try to like, they, they panic and they're like, oh, um, okay, I'm going to keep adding this. I'm going to keep adding this. I'm going to keep adding this. And then they actually end up saying something that's wrong or doesn't even apply to the problem whatsoever. So keep it simple. Don't interpret a p-value or don't interpret a level of confidence unless it's asked of you, right? You know, in the actual inference procedure, you don't have to tell me what a p-value is. You just got to find it. So sometimes kids will try to do too much and it's either wasting time or it's going to actually lead to something that's wrong. And if there's something wrong, you might get a deduction for it. Tip number two, read the question, then answer the question. Read each question twice. Take note of what it's asking. Highlight circle. I like, anytime I'm reading numbers, I'm writing them down. If it says the mean of the population is 62, I'm writing that down with proper symbols. That way I'm, I'm incorporating everything I'm reading. I'm putting it down because I know I'm probably going to need it. All right. Then only answer what's asking. Again, I mentioned this earlier. Many times kids will actually never the answer the question. Like the question says, um, is there evidence that the proportion of moose living in Alaska is more than 18%? I'm just making stuff up out of my head right now. But they're, they'll never literally answer that. Like they'll answer something, they'll write something that doesn't even apply to what the question asks. So always go back to the question, read it twice, and make sure that you directly answer it. If the question says, did you go to the store last night? Write down, yes, I did go to the store last night and I bought a gallon of milk and some chocolate chip cookies. Give me that context, okay? Um, a lot of times you're going to have an inference question says, is there statistical evidence? So make sure your answer starts with, yes, there is statistical evidence or no, there's not statistical evidence. So use the words directly from the problem in answering your question. Try not to start using things that aren't correct. That's my advice there. Final tip number one, be prepared and be confident, all right? I have, have many FRQ solution videos from previous years in my YouTube channel. Check them out, watch them. They'll actually show you the simplicity of going through FRQs. Uh, in the AP classroom, hopefully your teacher's giving you access to that. There's lots of great practice problems in there. And, and right now, the most important thing you could do is, is see what right answers look like. 
right? Do your, do your answers look like that? So that's why I really emphasize looking at some of my FRQ solution videos so you can actually see how things should be done to get full credit. Because again, sometimes kids do too much or too little and you don't want to lose points. And last piece of advice here, you don't have to get a high score to get a high score. What I mean by that, because it sounds kind of weird, right, is that typically around a 65% D is what's going to get you a great score of a 5. That's usually, and it varies every year, right? That's a big concept of AP statistics. Everything varies. But it's usually where it is. And usually around a 50% F is where you're going to get a 3. So you don't have to get everything right to get that score that you may want. Take your time, answer what you can, and move on. Just try not to leave anything blank. Guess on multiple choice. And for the FRQs, do everything you can for one, two, three, four, and five. And if there is a part of number six you leave blanks, so you just flat out didn't get to it, that's okay. You could still get a great score. All right, best of luck to you on the AP Stats Test. If you need anything from me, you know, shoot me something in the comment. I can try to see if I could help you in the last couple moments here. But I really hope everybody does well. Best of luck.